All right, y'all. Prophet David Taylor here. Uh, uh, actually, this video is pre-recorded uh, because I definitely wanted to release some word. I wanted to follow up on what we started on last week, but also wanted to enjoy the holiday. So the Holy Ghost said, well, why don't you pre-record it? So I pre-recorded it and I'm just dropping it on today. So if you're watching this video, you're watching it on July 4th or thereafter, but I dropped it on July 4th, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. So if you're watching it, that's why the format is a little bit different. I'm not actually broadcasting it live. Again, it's a pre-recorded video, but it'll be there for you uh, starting on July 4th. So if you don't watch live or if you don't watch during that time because you're enjoying your holiday, you can always go back the next day and watch this video. But I did want to follow up on what I started last week. What I started on last week was talking about Christian basics. Very, very, very important topic. So I wanted to be sure I followed up on that. So let's say a word of prayer and we'll jump right in. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you, Lord, for your precious Holy Spirit here to guide us. Thank you, Father. Father, please forgive me for any sin. Wash me clean. I must decrease so you can increase. So I die to myself right now, oh God, and ask you to breathe through me. That every word be spoken be what you want spoken so that you can get your word out to your people, oh God, so that you might be glorified, so that the saints might be edified, so that the demons might be terrified, and so that unbelievers would be mortified to live one more day without you. I thank you for it, and I believe you for it, and I declare and decree that signs and wonders and miracles shall follow all that hear, believe, and receive this word. I release it, I declare it, and I decree it. And we pray it and believe it. And thank you for it. We're looking for you to do great things. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, amen and amen. So last week, I strongly, strongly encourage you to watch last week's video. Okay, last week's video was basics part one. And I started talking about basic stuff and how there's a whole bunch of basic stuff we don't understand. Like, if God is so good, why is there so much evil in the world? I'm amazed at the amount of Christians that can't answer that question. How do we get in this mess? How do we get in a world that's full of domestic violence and rape and rheumatoid arthritis and dementia and racism and war and earthquakes and tragedies and people burning up in fires and babies dying? How, how did all that happen? Okay. That's the kind of stuff I talked about last week. So I strongly encourage you to go back and watch that video. That video is on my Facebook page, Basics Part 1, and also on my YouTube channel, Basics Part 1. What we're going to talk about today is Basics Part 2. Because where I left things on that video was, I said, I was talking about the what. What we needed to know and all that different kind of stuff. But then the question becomes, how? How do you develop your relationship with God? Okay, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today is the how, and I'm going to get into details, okay? So, first thing I want to do is ask a question. Do you have a best friend? Do you know the pleasure, the pain of a best friend? Do you know their smiles and their cries? Do they know yours? Okay, I stopped by to tell you, if you have a best friend, See, one of my longest friends, one of my friends, someone I've been friends with for a very long time, we were friends after two sentences, like literally two sentences, okay? We became friends like that. But my point in bringing that up is that you know them better now than you did when you first met them. Let me say that again. You know them better now than you did when you first met them, okay? Because those were two people that had to get to know each other, two people that spent time together, and two people that grew in that relationship. Isn't that right? Well, I stopped by to tell you that your relationship with God is the same way. That's the first point of breakdown in people's minds because your relationship with God works the same way. I know you think He's a genie, but he's not. I know you think that faith is magic. It's some type of magic cure-all. It's some type of thing where you say the magic words or wave the magic wand or you do the hokey pokey and stick your left foot in and put your right foot out and then that God is just going to magically fix all your problems 
and that you don't have any responsibility and that you're not going to reap what you sow and a whole bunch of stuff. I know that's what we think because first and foremost, that's what we want to believe. And second of all, because of so much bad teaching. But I stopped by to tell you that none of that is right. Okay, so that leads me to point number one. And here it comes. Point number one is that God is a person, not a set of rules. The reason that you have a personality is because you are imaged after the creator. Sense of humor, how good you are with numbers or not. Uh, your musical ability, your emotional capacity. Some people have five gallon hearts. Some people have 10 gallon hearts. Some people have 20 gallon hearts. The way you process information, your natural priorities, uh, what's important to you, your reaction to stress, how good you are with money or not, your learning style, audio, visual, kinesthetic. There's so many different things that make up your personality. Okay, You got all that from God. <laughs> I see God as a great big jewel. Okay, A great big jewel, the great jewel, the source of all creation, the source of all life. And we are shards, we are splinter. A shard is a splinter of a diamond or a splinter of a precious stone, a shard, okay? Or a splinter of glass. So, you know, a splinter splinter is made out of wood, the kind that, you know, hurts and gets in your skin. But a shard is a splinter of some type of glass or jewel. So I see God, I see Father, Son, and Holy Ghost as the great jewel. The creator, the source of all life, the source of all things. And we're shards. We're the only thing to our knowledge that he ever said he made in his image. So if we are persons and we have personalities, God is three distinct persons in one Godhead. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. They're definitely distinct persons, yet they're one. Because I was not Father on the cross. That was not the Holy Ghost on the cross, but the Holy Ghost was there holding Jesus up, helping him take everything he had to take and enabling him to die when he got ready. But that was actually the Son of God turned into a man on the cross. Okay? When the Son of God got baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist, Father spoke from heaven. Jesus was there in the Jordan River and the Holy Ghost descended like a dove. That's all three of them in time and space. Three distinct persons, yet one Godhead. Do not try to understand that. Do not ask anybody to explain that. You can get a revelation of it. Bishop Jakes talked about how his mom got a revelation of God because she was in the kitchen cooking eggs. And when she cracked the egg, she said, wait a minute, an egg has three parts. An egg has a shell, an egg has that, that goop, and then an egg has that bright yellow yolk. That's three distinct things, but it's one egg. And she called Bishop Jakes and said, there is a God. So you get a revelation of God in many ways because there are many three and ones in life. But you can't figure that out. You can't understand that. So don't try. He's the maker. You don't tell him what kind of form or how he has to be. He made us. He made you. We didn't make him. So don't try to figure that out. Don't try to understand it. Okay. But my point here, don't try to understand it with this, I mean, because you can't fit it in this. But my point is, is that God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost is a person, three persons, a person. That's why you have a personality, okay? God's a person. He's not a set of rules. And when you get around religious people, what do they talk about? Inevitably, without fail, they talk about the rules. Just think about it. Think about any rel religious situation you've ever been in. How do religious people talk? They talk about the rules, what you do and don't do, and all this different kind of stuff. God's a person, which leads me to my second point. My first point is that God's a person, not a set of rules. My second point is that God never gave us religion. God never gave us religion. God always gave us relationship. God meant for Adam to fellowship with him as he came down to spend time with them in the garden at the end of the day. That is not religion. God did not staple a set of rules on a tree and then say, all right, Adam and Eve, y'all go on about your business. <laughs> That's not what happened. 
but rather the Lord came down to fellowship with them at the end of the day. Is that in the Bible? It is. And here it is. That is in Genesis 3 and 8. King James Version. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Good God Almighty. That verse is action-packed. They heard. They heard the voice. That's somebody speaking of the Lord God walking. God's voice was walking. That's a trip. That visual. <laughs> they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. In the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the rules. I'm sorry. Hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God. Because he's a person amongst the trees of the garden. God never gave us religion. That's what I'm trying to get you to understand. God never gave us religion. What about all the stuff that he said to Moses and what about the Ten Commandments and what about all that? That was still relationship. I'm going to get to that in a minute. But God never gave us religion. That's why religion is so messed up. That's why religion has messed up so many people. And that's why, if you've ever noticed, if you ever just step back because... I've had these conversations, oh man, since I was 18 or 19 years old, and I haven't been 18 in a minute. I've had these conversations for decades where people were talking about which religion is right, because this religion says this, and this religion says that, and then inside of each religion are different sects, or S-E-C-T-S, not S-E-X, S-E-C-T-S, sects, not intercourse, or which is just a division. So among Protestant Christians, Protestants are not Catholics. Catholic is another brand or division of Christianity. Protestants are not Catholics. Uh, among Protestant Christians, there are so many different denominations. Presbyterian, Lutheran, African Methodist, Episcopal, Episcopalians, uh, Pentecostals, Char Charismatics, Baptists, C uh, 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 the CMEs, but not the CMEs that I'm talking about because it's Christian United Methodist and all that. CMEs I'm talking about is Christmas, Mother's Day, and Easter, but that's another thing. So the point, <laughs> the point I'm trying to make is that even among Protestant Christianity, there's all these brands of Christianity. So at some point in your life, you may have stepped back or people that are outside of the faith that have no religious belief at all, you may have stepped back and you say, now wait just a minute now. Which one of these is right? I don't understand. Okay, I stopped by to tell you. God never gave us religion. God never gave us religion. God always gave us relationship. And when God established his covenant, his contract on earth, he did it by creating a family. Did you ever think about that? This is what I mean about how people seem like, you know, we read the Bible for years, but you don't see what's right in front of you. When God wanted to create us on earth, he created a family, a family that he wanted to fellowship with. I just read it to you. And then when Adam and Eve messed that up, he made another covenant with Noah. And Noah and his family <laughs> saved humanity. And then when God wanted to establish his covenant again on earth, he made a covenant with Abraham. And the promise he gave to Abraham was that he would give him a family that was as big as the stars in the heavens, as big as the sands uh, on the beach. He said, I'm going to give you a family. I'm going to make you the father of many nations. He made a family. <laughs> How people can read the Bible for years and miss everything I just said is beyond me. But God never gave us religion. Not even when he gave Moses the Ten Commandments. That was not a religion. God was trying to help his people get to know him. <clears throat> but God never gave us religion. That's why religion is so messed up. That's why religion tends to, to uh, divide people because the scripture says there's a unity in the spirit. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. But religion tends to deeply divide people. Well, God never gave us religion. God always gave us relationship. So that's the first point. That's the first hurdle you've got to get over. Especially if you grew up under a particular type of religion and you got acclimated to the way they do things and their rules and they told you that if you didn't do it, the way they did it, that you were going to go to hell and 
And that was the beginning of your religious abuse. That was the beginning of the skewing of your relationship with God because somebody gave you religion and beat you over the head with the rules. Mm. I could do a whole message just on that, but we got to move on. So point number one, God is a person, not a set of rules. That's why you have a personality because you're imaged after him. God is all the things we are. God is conservative. God is liberal. God is serious. God is funny. God is extremely detailed. God is don't worry about the details because I love you. All the things we are, we're shards. We're a little splinter of him. Okay. So the question then becomes, if God is a person, not a set of rules, one, and two, if God never gave us religion, he always gave us relationship, then the next thing is three, how do you develop your relationship with God? Okay, how do I develop it? <clears throat> God is equal to his word. Now, the reason we have such a hard time with that is people is because we are not. <laughs> is <laughs> because we are not we are not equal to our word how do I know that's true Easy, easiest example of course is divorce you stood up there and you took a vow you said I do I will I take I take I will I do I take I do I will then you got home and you said I won't so we break our word all the time we said for better or for worse until it got worse then you said, I'm out. You said, forget this story. I'm out. Okay. So we break our word all the time. That's why we have such a hard time relating to God because God's word cannot be broken. And God is equal to his word. So whatever God says he is, it's one and the same. Once again, that's something you have to get by revelation. That's not something you're going to be able to figure out with this. You dis, the, your brain is not what God gave you to deal with him. It's this, your spirit, the breath of life inside of you. And light and understanding come on in your spirit. That's how you deal with God. Not through, because you can't fit God in this. This is for navigating this natural world out here. But, but you can't fit God in this. You can forget that. So, so uh, God is equal to his word. So if you want to get to know God, you have to spend time with his word. Now, this is another place that religion has completely jacked us up because religion substitutes rules, but it also gives us bad, unhealthy, or just plain false interpretations of his word. Mm. I know a lot of the Bible critics talk about that, but there are a lot of Bible believers that struggle with that too. Because there's this pressure when you're a Christian to think that you have to have all the answers, that you have to know everything, that my church is better than yours, that I know more scripture than you. Oh, we've already been through the book of Revelation. We already did that. I'm more saved than you. All that is the failings of people. That's not the Lord. All that is human pride, human fear, human insecurity that makes you think this is a contest. It's not a contest. This is a relationship. Your relationship with God is not a contest. It's not a I'm more saved than you contest. But that's what people turn it into. And they give you straight up bad teaching or they give you unhealthy teaching or they give you stuff that's just straight up false. It just ain't true. And a lot that's the beginning of religious abuse. A lot of us have been abused in the name of God. And again, religious abuse is an entire topic unto itself. It's an entire study. But a lot of us, we have this phrase, church hurt. A lot of us have been hurt in church. You've been hurt in church because you came up on some situations you didn't expect to find in the house of God. You came upon some people or some people that made some choices or someone disappointed you or somebody betrayed you or somebody was just straight up a wolf in sheep's clothing. Like they didn't know God at all. They weren't interested. They weren't there because of God. They just kind of tried to front like they were. And ended up trying to devour you, ended up trying to completely consume your life, okay? Because they their motive was not to glorify God or whatever. And if you've been in church more than five minutes, you've got some church hurt. 
because you've discovered that people in the church aren't perfect and people in the church can fall. Because sometimes people make mistakes. Sometimes like they didn't have an intention. Like they didn't set out in their heart and their mind to do what they did. But as time went on, they went down a wrong path. Next thing you know, they've gotten into sin and they fall. And they've gotten out of the will of God. They got out of place and started doing things they didn't have no business doing and they fell. They made a mistake. They messed up. All of that kind of stuff happens in church because we are flawed human beings. But from that, we get that phrase we call church hurt. And a lot of people let that knock them away from God and they never come back. But I stopped by to tell you, if you've been disappointed by people, that is common. That's going to happen if you live. But don't let that take you away from God. Don't let your church hurt. Don't let your disappointment don't let your shock, don't let your betrayal, don't let anything that happened take you away from your actual relationship with God. Okay? Because God never meant for us to be abused in his name. God does not abuse us in his name. That's people and that's the devil. Okay? But if you've got church hurt, as so many of us do, you do not have to allow that to take you away from your walk with God. Maybe you can't fellowship with that person anymore. Maybe you can't fellowship in that space anymore. Okay? Maybe you might have to change the way you do things, the way you worship, or whatever. But don't give up your relationship with God because somebody, some person hurt you. Because we all go through that. There's no exceptions. Leaders, lay people, you know, people, clergy, people of the cloth, congregation, congregational people, uh, your congregants, your parishioners, whatever. We all go through that. We've all been disappointed. We've all been hurt. We've all been shocked sometimes at some of the stuff that's gone on in the house of God. Even the Lord went through that when he overturned the money changers tables when he walked to earth as a man. He got angry and whipped in people out the temple because he's like, this is not what the house of God is supposed to be for. So there's your proof. Even Jesus had to deal with that. Even Jesus had to deal with people in the house of God doing things they shouldn't have been doing. So I say that not to justify any bad thing that's ever happened to you. So please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not trying to justify or excuse any bad thing that's happened to you and also any bad thing that you've done. Because we spend all this time talking about when we've been, when we've been done wrong. Don't spend nearly as much time talking about it as when you did wrong. See how we conveniently skip that part. Because I know you've got stories you can tell. I know you could talk for hours about how no good this pastor was and this leader and this prophet and this worship team and how no good and they was doing this and blah, 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 blah. I notice that your verbal time is spent talking about what other people did to you. Funny how you seem to have cut out maybe what you did to them. Maybe you had a relationship you shouldn't have had. Maybe you did some funny stuff with the money. Maybe you were in the house of God for the wrong reasons. Okay? But the point I'm trying to make is that this is just a part of living. So I'm not trying to minimize anything that happened to you, but I'm also not trying to minimize anything that you did. We're all responsible for what we do. But my point in bringing this up is saying that church hurt is a part of life. You have it and you've caused some. But that is not a reason to walk away from God. Maybe you can't be around those people anymore. And maybe you can't be in that congregation or that fellowship or that denomination or whatever have you. But you don't have to give up your relationship with God just because some people hurt you or just because you failed. Because they might cast you out. God is a God of second chances. They might be done with you, but the Lord might not be done with you. It's a relationship. Just because you failed in such a way that they don't want to be bothered with you anymore does not mean that God feels that way. Just because they rejected you does not mean that God is rejecting you. It doesn't mean your mistakes are okay. But you don't have to give up your relationship with God. That's my point here. Because church hurt is a whole nother, I could do another hour on that. Okay? <clears throat> So church hurt is we have to stop using that as a crutch and we have to stop using that as an excuse to, to give up or mess up our relationship with God because of what we've been through. And then some stuff is just straight up the devil. 
Okay, well, the devil is a devil is a devil. When he shows up, he's trying to steal something from you. He's trying to hurt you. He's trying to kill you. He's trying to destroy you in some kind of way because that's what Satan does because that's what's in him. So some stuff we've been through is just straight up the devil. Don't let the devil push you out of your relationship with God because he's going to try. He's going to try every trick he has to try to make you hate God, to try to make you stay angry with God, to try to keep you confused and in darkness so he can torment you, so he can abuse you, so he can stop you from reaching your potential, so he can stop God from using your life and blessing your life because that's what the devil does. <laughs> Once again... We're not always prepared for that in life. And so that's why it comes as a shock when it happens. Because the devil's coming after you. The devil's coming at you. One way or another. Okay? That's just part of dealing with life on earth. Because the devil was in the Garden of Eden. We never had a life where we didn't have to deal with the devil. That's my point. A lot of people talk about paradise. They talk about Eden. They talk about a whole bunch of things. We never had a life... <laughs> where we didn't have to deal with the devil. That is not biblical, okay? That is not the truth. And if somebody told you that, that's a straight up lie because the devil was in the Garden of Eden. We never had a life where we didn't have to deal with Satan. So stop expecting one, okay? So if we can acknowledge church hurt, if we can acknowledge struggles with the devil, if we can acknowledge that some of the stuff we've been taught was bad, unhealthy, and just plain false, then the next obvious question is, well, Prophet Taylor, how do we know the false from the true? How do we know the false from the true? And the answer to that question is bank tellers. Er, what'd you say? <laughs> I said bank tellers. How do bank tellers know counterfeit money? The way they train bank tellers to know counterfeit money is because they spend so much time with real money. The way they are trained to recognize counterfeit is that they are taught what real money looks like, what it smells like, because it does have a smell. Different details on the printing. There's a little strip in the middle you have to hold up to the light to see all different kind of stuff. Money has a certain weight. Real money has a numerical system. So they are taught to recognize counterfeit money by spending so much time with real money. And when you spend a, a whole bunch of time with real money, that's what makes counterfeit jump out at you. Because you know the false when you see it. Mmm. So what's my point? My point is that's how you know the false from the truth with God. You have got to spend time with God just like you do anything else. Good God Almighty. I can stay right there. That's the breakdown. I'm going to talk about it some more later. But that's the breakdown in people's minds. That's the breakdown in people's minds is that they don't want to spend time with the Lord. They want somebody else to do the work for them. And it just gives them the benefit. That's what people think church is. People think church is, well, people think church is a lot of things. But one of the things people think church is, is you going somewhere and the man or woman of God, the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, bishop, deacon, or elder has spent time with the Lord, has spent time in, in, or in the word, and they're going to bring the word, which is right. But that's all the work that needs to be done. So you just go to hear them. Ooh, child, pastor preached today. Ooh, child, we had church today. That's just religion. Because you go to hear them and you think that's the end of the equation. Mm -mm, mm -mm. See, so that's how, uh, that's another point of breakdown that people just don't want to deal with. Okay? You have to spend time with God for yourself, just like every other relationship that you have. And I'm going to hit on this some more later, but eventually you're going to understand that there's not an excuse. There's not. 
All excuses that you want to bring up, like church hurt, like busyness, like whatever, whatever, there's not an excuse. When you die, okay, when you live, God writes down everything that you say, God writes down everything that you do, and God also writes down your motives when you do it. So God is always recording everything you say, like everything I'm saying right now, God's writing it down in heaven right now. And when I stay in the judgments, God's going to say on, uh, well, I'm not going to tell you what time I'm taping this, but on the day and time I tape this, God's going to say, you said this and you did that according to my records, because he's writing down everything I'm saying. So God writes down, that's in the Bible, God writes down everything you say, God writes down everything you do, and God writes down your motives. So he doesn't just look at what you do, he looks at why you do what you do. God writes all that down. When you stand before God in judgment, he's going to have a book of your life, not just the book of life, but literally a book of your life. Like my book is going to be, you know, David Taylor II. And he has a book where he has all that information, all that data about you in his book. And when he judges you, he's going to judge you out of that book. He's literally going to judge you based on how you lived, what you said, what you did, and why you did it. So that's why you need to understand that all them excuses that we tend to make, I've been hurt, I'm too busy, I got abused as a child, and I'm not trying to minimize that. Don't, don't twist what I'm saying. I'm not trying to minimize because we have to work through stuff. We have to work through stuff when we've been hurt. So don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm saying that you can't let that become a, a crutch, and you can't let yourself think that because you've had disadvantages, because you've had hard times, because you've had to go through some things, you might have had to deal with the devil face to face like Jesus did, like Job did, just straight Satan, just face to face with the dragon. There still, at the end of your life, is not going to be an excuse. You are, rather, going to be judged by your creator, the one that made you in his image, based on what you said, what you did, and why you did it. And there's not going to be any excuses in the day of judgment. There's just going to be your words, your choices, and your motives before God. So I say that to say that for all the people that say you don't have time to spend time with the Lord, that's a lie and that's, it. that's an excuse. Prophet Taylor, that's a very bold statement to make for you to say that's a lie. But it is a lie. How can you say that? You don't know me. You don't know my life. How can I say it's a lie? Here's how I know it's a lie. Because you make time for what's important to you. If I told you your favorite celebrity was on Michigan Avenue, because uh, I'm in Chicago, on the Magnificent Mile, if I told you your favorite celebrity was downtown right now, on the streets, signing autographs, giving a concert, giving an interview, uh, releasing their new book, what taking pictures, whatever. You would get up out of whatever situation you're in, your bed, your job, your classroom, wherever you're in, and you would make a beeline to your favorite celebrity. Yes, you would. You call your boss and say, well, I'm going on lunch, or you know, I had an accident, or you find a way, and that's my point. Your favorite celebrity, I'm not talking about celebrities you don't care about. I'm talking about your favorite celebrity that you're always obsessing over. If they were downtown Chicago or wherever you live, downtown, wherever you live right now, you would get up. I don't care if it's the middle of the night. I don't care if it's like 2.30 in the morning. You would get up and you would go to where they were so you could spend time with them. Don't even try and front like that's not true. Yes, you would. Yes, you would. So that demonstrates that you would make the effort for someone that you cared about. That you would make the effort for something that you cared about. That's why there's no excuse before God. If you don't spend time with the Lord, it's because you choose not to, not because you can't. So you have to spend time with him, just like every other relationship that you have. That's how, that's the bank teller. You spend so much time around the real that it, it begins to train you to discern the false. That's how. 
And when you refuse to do that, that's what opens the door for religious abuse. When you think it's somebody else's responsibility uh, for your walk with God, nobody else is responsible for your walk with God. Okay? So, <clears throat> there's three levels of word, because I told you God was equal to his word. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> there's three levels of word. And you have to know all three. Now, let me say right off the bat that if you have any type of religious training, probably what happened in your life is that you were in situations where someone planted their flag and said just one level of word or this thing. This thing is the most important thing, but there's actually three and you need all three. And here they are. There's the written word, the Bible. There's the living word, Jesus Christ. And there's the rhema word, which comes through the prophetic. One more time. There's the written word, which is the Bible. There's the living word, which is Jesus. And then there's the rhema word, which comes through the prophetic. So I'm going to explain all three. First, let me read you some uh, background about the written word, the Bible. And this is, I'm talking about the King James Version. Now, you need to understand something. Studying the Bible as a piece of literature, studying the Bible as a literary work can be a lifetime study. There's so much to learn about the Bible as a written work. I'm not talking about as a living word of God right now. I'm talking about as a literary work, as who wrote it, who wrote the different books, how was it written, what was it written on, when were the different books written, what's the chronological order, what's included in scripture, all that, as a literary work, as, a, as an assembled book. You can spend the rest of your life studying because there's so much to learn. So much to learn just to study the Bible as a literary work. Okay? So, you know, we're not going to try to get a degree today. I'm just going to talk about some basic stuff. Okay? That's the title of this, Basics Part 2. So you can get some basic stuff down so you can start your journey. Okay? So don't feel intimidated. And also... Don't feel full of yourself. Don't go to either extreme. Don't feel full of yourself if you have better than average knowledge of the Bible as a literary work. And don't feel intimidated if you really don't know that much about the Bible. Okay? Because neither one of those things is what makes us right with God. It's the blood of Jesus, not you. So we're not going to get lifted up in pride, but we're also not going to be intimidated. Okay? So the King James Version, which is one of the more popular versions, also known, as a, also known as the King James Bible, is an English translation of the Christian Bible for the Church of England, commissioned in 1604 and completed in 1604 and published seven years later in 1611 under the sponsorship of King James uh, VI and uh, the seventh, I believe it is, or Wiki says the first, but that could be a little bit messed up. But the point is, is that the king, multiple kings, commissioned the English translation of the scriptures. That's what the King James Bible is. It's an English translation. We'll get to the original languages in a minute. The books of the King James Version include the 39 books of the Old Testament, the intertestamental section uh, called the Apocrypha, which contains 14 books, and then the 27 books of the New Testament. Okay? King James Version has been described as one of the most important books in English culture and a driving force in the shaping of the English-speaking world. Okay? Now, the Old Testament was translated from Hebrew and Aramaic. The Apocrypha was translated from Greek and Latin. The New Testament was translated from Greek. And then there's different kinds of Greek because there was a more common Greek tongue, like what the Lord spoke, and then there's a more formal interpretation of the language. I told you, it gets really deep. So when we read the Bible in English, we're reading a translation of the original text. And I'll say it again. The Old Testament is in Hebrew and Aramaic. The Apocrypha is in Greek and Latin. And the New Testament is in Greek, different kinds of Greek, different levels of Greek. So understand that when you read the Bible in English, you're reading a translation. Okay? That's very, very important. 
Now, the apocrypha, if you've never heard that word before, uh, it denotes the collection of apocryphal book, ancient books. And they're thought to have been written sometime between 200 BC, which is roughly 200 years before the Lord showed up as a man, and 400 AD. So that's about a 600 year span of time where books that were written <clears throat> that ended up not being included in some versions of the Bible, because the most common versions of the Bible now have the Old Testament and the New Testament. And uh, some term them deuterocanonical books. So traditional 80 book Protestant Bibles include the Apocrypha as a section between the Old Testament and the New. So that's a whole nother story. Uh, that's a whole nother field of study, the Apocrypha, because many concluded them to be maybe historically accurate, but non-canonical, non not needed to be included in the scripture, but some don't agree with that. So don't worry about that for right now. We can get everything we need to get from the Old Testament and the New Testament, but we can also study the Apocrypha as well. Don't get hung up on that. Just be aware of that because I'm giving you basics. I told you we're not getting a degree today. So don't don't tune out on me. Don't, you know, stay with me because we're going to keep it really simple because I'm aiming this, especially at people that are just starting out. But also, if you've been in the kingdom a while, but you know you got a bunch of bad teaching, because some of y'all looking at me have been walking with God for a while, but you've been in situations that kind of threw you off track. And sometimes you kind of have to rebuild your life. Sometimes you have to start over. Okay, so that's why we're just going to do basic stuff today. But you just need to know what that is. You don't have to be a Bible scholar to understand the written word. This has been often used as a barrier by some religious institutions saying that lay people could not understand the word of God. Now, I just want you to think about that because that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense that lay people couldn't understand the Bible. Because what would you do if you were born in a country where there were no lay people. What would you do if you were born at a certain time? Because remember, nobody in the Bible had the completed canon of scripture like we do now. What did then people depend on? Then people depended on the other two I told you about, the personal relationship with Jesus, the living word, and the prophetic, the rhema word, because they didn't have the completed canon of scripture. So don't tell me. <laughs> Don't tell me that you have to be a Bible scholar to understand, understand the scriptures or to walk with God. No, you don't. You do have to grow in your knowledge. But, you know, they, they, many, many institutions have said that lay people can't understand the scriptures. And why in the world could God possibly hold you responsible for something that you can't understand? Just think about that. See, that's unjust. That's how I know it's not from God, because God is just. God is just in all his ways. Everything that God does is right. Everything that God does is just. There's no injustice in him, and there's no unjustness about him. And how could God possibly hold you responsible for something that you couldn't understand? You can understand the scriptures, and you can understand the scriptures for yourself. There's just different levels of understanding, and today we're dealing with basics. See, a lot of people... When they say, well, I'm just trying to know what's right. You see, okay, what they mean is, they mean is which preacher should I follow? Which denomination or which division? Or which brand of Christianity is right? That's another one I could do a whole hour on, on because America is good for that. I've never lived anywhere else. I know it's true in other places, but, I, you know, America is good for selling you a brand of Christianity. And... For people in those brands pitting their brand against somebody else's brand saying that these people ain't saved because they don't do it like we do it. Lord have mercy, we are so good for that. And there's a lot of stuff on TV, not just ministry, you know, reality TV. There's a lot of stuff on TV where people are selling you a brand. They're selling you a brand of Christianity. And it may not even be Bible Christianity, but they're sure selling it to you because they're making money off of it. It's a commercialized product. Okay, so if those are the kinds of questions you're asking, you are again missing the point. The point is not which preacher should I follow. The point is not which denomination is right. The point is not which brand of Christianity to you, do you subscribe to. That's not the point. The point is, do you know the Lord for yourself? 
Because that's what it's going to come down to. Remember we talked about that last week? About how you can live your whole life and miss God completely? When you stand before God, the words that the Lord used was, I never knew you. I is a personal pronoun. Never knew. We were never intimate. You, another personal pronoun. That's a relationship between two people. Did you notice he didn't quote any rules? He said, I <laughs> never knew you. We never had a relationship. Matthew 7, 23. So that's what I mean when I tell you, you can't get caught up in all this other stuff that don't mean nothing about nothing. And just like I said last time, that a whole lot of people missed the point of 2020 because God shut all the religion down. God shut everything down. We couldn't go to church for a year and a half, 18 months of isolation to give you an opportunity for you to discover whether or not you really know the Lord or not for yourself. Understand? Okay. And a part of that is just laziness because you don't want to put forth the effort. You would for your favorite celebrity, though. You would for somebody that you're sleeping with. If there's somebody that you're sleeping with or somebody that you really, really want to sleep with really, really badly, you would pull out all the stops. Yes, you would. Don't tell me you would. Don't even try to front like that ain't true. Yes, you would. If you had an opportunity to sleep with somebody you have lusted after for a while, you would take it like that. If you had to travel several states over, you would take it like that. Yes, you would. Yes, you would. That's how we know that we're just being lazy. If you don't spend time with the Lord, you're just being lazy. You just don't want to. There's no excuse. And again, that's what opens the door for religious abuse. <clears throat> when you don't take responsibility for your own spiritual life. That's the same as those people that sue fast food joints. Saying, this fast food place made me fat. Uh, you're responsible for what you put in your body. <laughs> and you're responsible for what you put in your spirit. So don't try to put that off on somebody else. Okay? <clears throat> they just want to check off boxes and they just want to be religious. And they just want to say, I'm better than you. But maybe you've never heard anybody say what I'm saying now. And the truth is that you have to put forth the effort. The Lord will show up. God is already right there in his word. The Lord will show up in your room, in your quiet place, in your quiet time. But you have to put forth the effort. You have to put forth the effort. And if you don't put forth the effort, that's just you being lazy. And you open the door for spiritual and religious abuse because you think that somebody else is going to take care of your relationship with God with you, for you, and just give you the benefit. So I'm going to just hear the preacher, you study the word, and just tell me what to do. And I get, mm -mm. That's how all that religious abuse gets started. Because you don't know the word for yourself. When I was little, I told God, I want to know you for myself. Okay? So let's look at some examples in the scripture of what I'm talking about. And my first favorite example is Matthew 4, 5 through 7. Matthew 4, 5 through 7 is Jesus in the wilderness. Okay, this is right after he got baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist. Jesus got driven into the wilderness to fast 40 days and he got tempted by the devil. The devil tempted him with three things. This one that we're, re we're reading right here is the second temptation out of the three. Matthew 4, 5 through 7. Then the devil took him, Jesus, to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Good God Almighty. So many things in that. What did the Bible just tell you? The Bible just told you that the devil is not above misquoting scripture to try to throw you off track. Because what the devil was quoting was Psalm 91, 11 and 12. For he's given his angels charge over me to keep me in all my ways. They bear me up in their hands. Lest I dash my foot against the stone. That's what Satan quoted to Jesus. Also, the devil quoted the written word to the living word. That ought to show you the boldness of the devil. That's why some people don't understand why some people are so bold. Because Satan is bold. He'll use the Bible itself to try to mess you up in your relationship with God. So what's the difference? between what the devil said and what the Lord said. Because the devil quoted scripture and the Lord quoted scripture. What's the difference? 
here it is. The difference is the devil quoted the Bible. The Lord knew the God of the Bible. The devil quoted what God said. The Lord knew what God meant. That's the difference. That's what happens when you have a relationship versus religion. When you are a religious person and you have religion, you just pop off scripture. You just quote scripture because you think that's what matters. You are supposed to memorize scripture. Don't get me wrong. But the devil quoted the Bible. So you ain't said nothing just because you quote the Bible. Jesus knew the God of the Bible and made a decision based on the fact that he knew that just because God promises you angelic protection, it does not mean you do foolish things like throw yourself off a mountain and then demand that God catch you on the way down. Thou shalt not put the Lord thy God to the test or thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Because the devil quoted the Bible, Jesus knew the God of the Bible. The devil quoted what God said, Jesus knew what God meant. Okay? Don't they do the same thing in the media? You say something, then they quote you. Then you say, wait, 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 that's a misquote. No, you said. I said, yeah, that's what I said, but that's not what I meant. Is that right or wrong? Have you ever been misquoted? Have you ever read a misquote where somebody said something and then people just went all off the deep end and they had to come back and say, well, this is what I meant by what I said. Y'all took it the wrong way. You twisted it into something I wasn't trying to say. You ever seen that? Okay, that's the difference. That's why you have to know the Lord for yourself. That's why you have to know the scriptures for yourself. Okay, memorizing scripture is good, but they teach you that in church to memorize scripture. That's good and that's right. But memorizing the Bible is not going to do you any good if you don't know the God of the Bible. If you can quote what God said, that's not going to do you any good unless you know what God meant by what he said. And to know that, you have to know him. Uh, here's another scripture I want to give you, and this will explain a lot. Hebrews 5, 13 and 14. Listen to it carefully. I'm reading the Berean Study Bible version. For everyone who lives on milk is still an infant, inexperienced in the message of righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained their senses to distinguish good from evil. Good God Almighty. That's a three-slap scripture. Ha! Ah! One more time, Hebrews 5, 13 and 14. For everyone who lives on milk is still an infant, still a baby. If you're on the milk of the word, inexperienced in the message of righteousness. But solid food, meat, is for the mature, who by constant use have trained their senses to distinguish good from evil. Lord have mercy. There's your answer. I don't care if you've never read that verse before. I'm glad to introduce it to you. I don't care if you don't like it. And I don't care if you don't want to do it. There's your answer. The Bible says that just like in the natural, when we come out here, we're on mother's milk. We're on the breast or we're on formula in countries that can make formula. Otherwise, you have to nurse at your mother's breast. We're on milk. We're on breast milk. That's natural when you're a baby. But then as you mature, you get into solid food. That's why your teeth come in. So you can chew that solid food. But solid food is for the mature. Okay? Remember I told you how just like in the natural, when you come out of your mother's womb, you're just a baby. When you first get saved, you first get born again, you're a baby in the spirit. So the Bible tells you that there's a maturation process in the spirit, just like it is in the natural. This stuff is not hard to understand. That's what I'm telling you. You don't have to get confused. This stuff is not hard to understand. Just like you have to grow up in the natural, you have to grow up in the spirit. Solid food is for the mature who by constant use, there it is. In other words, you have to get in the word and use the word and make your mistakes and, and study and get some interpretations and work with it. You got to do it. Constant use. Constant use. It's the same way with playing an instrument. It's the same way we learn how to fight. It's the same way with using a sword. Same way with using a gun. Same way with penmanship. Same way with drawing. Same way with anything. Same way with cooking. You got to burn a few dishes, got to oversalt some dishes, you got to underseason some dishes until you get it right. But you get it right because you keep doing it. And that's my point. 
So the people say, well, I don't understand the Bible. No, that means you haven't put forth any effort. Like you read two scriptures and you didn't get it, so you just closed the Bible and gave up. You ain't going to never get it. Constant use have trained their senses to distinguish good from evil. In plain English, it's by spending time in the Word and getting right interpretations and finding out what that means and what that looks like that helps you distinguish from when you hear some stuff that's off. You have to get in the word, you have to use it, you have to do it. You have to do it. There is no other way and there is no excuse. So if you're one of those people who said, I don't have time to read the Bible, then, then everything that happens after that, that was your choice. You never put forth the effort to try to learn how to understand the scriptures because the Bible says you have to grow up. There's a maturation process, but you, you do that by constantly doing it, constantly getting in the word. That's what helps you get familiar. If you don't want to do that and you don't want to read the scriptures and you think that's somebody else's responsibility, so I'm going to just go to church and let the, let the pastor, let the preacher do that and you don't study the scriptures for yourself, that's on you. That's not on them. That's on you. And if something happened where you didn't have enough word or enough faith to defend yourself against the devil, that's on you. A lot of Christians do that all the time. Lord, I, if I had a dollar... <laughs> If I could make you understand how many times I've heard people say stuff like this, 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 and this. And if it be his will, and if God, and God is in control, and God is in charge, and that kind of thing, these people that don't know the scriptures. These are people that just accepted loss from the devil because they didn't know that God is not trying to bring you any loss. That's the devil. Stealing, killing, and destroying is the mark of Satan. Well, I guess the Lord didn't want us to have no more kids. Did you want some more kids? Did you have a working reproductive system? What happened? Because if there's an accident, tragedy, tragedy, sickness, disease, or injury, that's not from the Lord. So many different things we blame God on because we don't know him. And I hear people say stuff like that all the time. You got to get in the word, get in the word, get in the word. When you get in the word, you'll discover that there were people in the Bible who were infertile. There were people in the Bible who the woman's womb was closed. There were people in the Bible who just were straight up old and all them people had babies. <laughs> How you going to tell me God could give them a baby and God wouldn't give you a baby or another baby or your first baby? You have to be in the word to know that. Older people who were past a point where they kind of aged out of their reproductive years ended up having kids. People who hadn't been able to get pregnant at all Ended up having kids. And then this one lady had a child. I talked about it last time. Oh, I talked about it on Where Are the Miracles? That boy lived to the age of 12 and died. So that woman went back to the prophet that told her she was going to have the child with her older husband. And that prophet raised that boy back from the dead. And that woman got her son back. You have to be in the word to know that. So many people have accepted these tragedies. You understand that's the devil. Unless you did something to bring some sin in your bloodline, then it might be a consequence of your sin or it might be judgment. Once again, you have to be in the word to know that. Like, for example, adultery. Adultery gets you dead kids. When you sin with your seed, that sin comes back on your seed. That's a sin that produces some straight up death and confusion and perversion in your family. The devil might have brought the temptation, but you're li if you're living in affairs, you're doing stuff like that, that's going to get in the bloodline, that's going to get in the family, and then that death is going to manifest. See, that's sin that did that. That's the sin that caused that. That's not what God wanted. God wouldn't have said, thou shalt not commit adultery, if that's what he wanted. But if you do stuff like that, then that sin produces the death. Once again, you have to be in the word to know that. So if you're just running around waiting on somebody else to study the Bible for you, if you're just running around believing a whole bunch of stuff you heard because you never studied the scriptures, if you're just running around accepting everything that happens in your life as if everything that comes your way is the will of God, then that's on you. If you're one of those people that think that way, if you think that everything that happens in your life is what God wanted, not the truth. There are other players in the mix the devil, the demons, your parents, your friends, your own choices. There are other elements in the mix. The way God works is you got to choose his path. You have to choose to obey God. 
There are plenty of voices you can listen to. If you listen to the voice of the Lord, you're going to have to listen to it in opposition to them other voices. That's a choice. Because every voice, every speaking voice that comes to you ain't the Lord. But you got to be in the Word to know that. Some of y'all, this is the first time in your life you ever heard anybody say that. Because some of y'all have been accepting things your whole life that you thought was God. Because you never got in the Word to find out that's not the Lord. Like poverty. That's not the Lord. The Lord's first sermon said, I got, I came to preach the good news of the kingdom to the poor. What's the good news of the kingdom to the poor? That you don't have to be poor no more. A whole lot of people, they fight that, don't they? What's the good news to the brokenhearted? You can be healed emotionally, but also physically. You don't have to be sick no more. A whole lot of people, they fight that, don't they? Because they're not in the word. Or they got bad interpretations. Or they just simply don't know the Lord. How can you say you believe in the Bible and all Jesus did was go around healing as many people as he could of everything he could heal them from, which was everything. There's nothing they brought to Jesus he could not physically heal. How can you say that Jesus spent his entire public life healing and you don't believe in divine healing? I never have understood that. But I don't have to understand it. What I have to understand is the word. I don't have to understand how you got all twisted. But that's another example. See, that's why you hear so many crazy things. People just accepting stuff that's not from God. And the only way to know the false from the true is by reason of use. That you've been in the word so much. That you spent so much time around the true. That you can see the false when it show up. There is no other way. I just read it to you. There is no other way. So from this day forward, if you're hearing this message, it's on you. When you stand before God in judgment, after you after hearing this message, you won't be able to say, well, I didn't know. Because yes, you did know. And God's going to say, I sent a prophet in your midst to explain it to you in great detail. You got to get in the word. You. And you got to get in it every day. And you have to study the word for yourself. That's nobody else's responsibility. Let's read Matthew 5 and 6. Matthew 5 and 6 uh, says, Brian Study Bible. <clears throat> Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. I think I said filled. Filled is what I meant to say. Uh, King James uh, Version. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Okay? I, okay, so the Lord said, it's your hunger and your thirst for righteousness. That's what gets you filled up. How do we know what Jesus said is true? Because remember... And we're always trying to get now. Now, everything God says is multi layered and deep, yes. But sometimes we just try to get deep over simple stuff. When you when you thirst after something to drink, don't you seek out some water or some type of liquid refreshment until you get it? Doesn't your thirst push you to go somewhere and get something to drink to quench that thirst? Doesn't your hunger, when that stomach is a rumbling, especially if you haven't eaten in a while, that stomach is a rumbling, that stomach is letting you know we need some fuel. Don't you push to go somewhere and get something to eat? Well, that's for your body, your natural body. Your spirit is the same way. Your spirit needs the water of the Holy Ghost. Good God Almighty, your spirit needs to bathe and let the Holy Ghost just anoint you and fill you and fall over, all over you. Your spirit needs the blood of Jesus to cleanse it, to wash it, and your spirit needs the, the, the word of God to fill you. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. It's just ministering to different parts of you. So just like a cheeseburger and some fries and some Pepsi <laughs> ministers to the shell or uh, fruit, vegetables, and water for the super healthy meals. First Corinthians and Second Samuel and Psalms 95 and Genesis 2 and Revelation 3 is the food for the spirit. Okay, the blood of Jesus and the water of the Holy Ghost uh, to wash you and cleanse you and fill you is for the spirit. This stuff is not hard. This stuff is not hard and it's your responsibility. All right. <clears throat> That's the Bible. That's the written word. Next, we're going to move to the second uh, type of word, which is the living word. Jesus is the Bible made flesh. Jesus is the Bible turned into a person, or conversely, uh, the Bible 
is Jesus turned into a written book. Jesus Christ is God turning himself into a man so he could understand and relate to and pay for our experience. Jesus is both God and man. Everything God is, Jesus is, and everything we're supposed to be, Jesus is. But the main thing I want you to get there is that Jesus is the word turned flesh. Jesus is the Bible in action. Everything that the Bible says and is about is who the Lord is in person. They're the same. The written word is never in contradiction with the living word. That's why the devil couldn't use the Bible to fool Jesus. Because Jesus is the God of the Bible and Jesus knew the God of the Bible. Jesus knew what Father meant when he said that. De the devil quoted what the Bible said. Jesus knew what God meant by what he said. Okay? So Jesus is the word made flesh. He's the Bible turned into a person. One more time. He's the Bible turned into a person. Everything in the scriptures is what you find in living color, in action, in Jesus Christ. That's who he is. And there's no contradiction between Jesus, the living word, and the Bible, the written word. Let's look at John 1, 1 through 4. John chapter 1, the book of John, the gospel of John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. In the beginning was the word, uh, I'm reading out the New International Version. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. Once again, those verses are action-packed. So in other words, the Bible says that the Son was with the Father when everything began, and the Son is also God himself. Remember I told you Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? So the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God. Don't try to figure that out. Don't try to make that make sense to your human mind. Okay? So when it says in the beginning was the Word, out of the Greek there, in the beginning was the Logos. Through him all things were made. Jesus made everything. Without him nothing was made that has been made. So in other words, Jesus is just as much God as Father God is God is just as much as the Holy Ghost is God. But when the Son of God became Jesus Christ, he turned himself into a man. He came through the womb of a woman. But he's still the Word made flesh. He's still everything that the Bible's talking about is the Lord as a person. Okay. And you have to get to know him by spending time with him. Okay, let's look at Revelation 1, 17 through 18 and get some more insight on Jesus and who he is. Revelation 1, 17 through 18. When I saw him, this is Apostle John talking. When I saw him, Jesus, when I saw Jesus, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then Jesus placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades, or death and hell. Notice the Lord kept using personal pronouns, I, because he's a person. I am the first and the last. I am first and the last. I am. That's what God said to Moses in the burning bush. I am that I am. Here's the Lord using the same language. See that? Because he's God in the flesh. He's the Bible in the flesh. Don't try to understand how such a thing is possible. I don't understand that. I accept it by faith. I, you can't figure God out. I done told you, you're going to hurt yourself. You're going to blow out a brain cell trying to squeeze God into this. God never asked you to understand what this. God asked you to believe. Okay? Let's look at Colossians 2.9. Colossians 2 and 9 says, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form. So in other words, the fullness of everything God is, is in Jesus. Everything God is, you find in Jesus. And everything man is supposed to be, you find in Jesus too. Well, well wait a minute, wait a minute, Prophet Taylor, what does that mean? I'll show you. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 45 through 49. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 45 to 49. I'm reading out of the New International Version. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, that's talking about Jesus, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man is of heaven. 
As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. In plain English, what that means is that Jesus is not just a full representation of God. Jesus is the full representation of everything humanity was supposed to be. Everything that they first created Adam to be, Adam fell from when he sinned and separated from God. I explained that to you last time. So what the Bible is saying is that Jesus is like the reboot, like the 2.0, like heaven's way of saying, this is what we had in mind when we made people. You get that? That's who the Lord is. Heaven's way of saying, well, when you see Jesus, this is what we had in mind when we made humans. Follow that? Okay. And then I think there's one more scripture I wanted to look at. Yes, and that is John 10, 27. Uh, the Gospel of John, John chapter 10, verse 27. Berean Study Bible Version. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. King James Bible. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Okay, once again, my is a personal pronoun. He's a person. Hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Notice the Lord did not say my lambs. Because when you're still a babe in Christ, the Lord could be talking to you and you don't know that's him. That's what happened to Samuel. Samuel was ordained a prophet before he was born and God trusted Hannah with Samuel. So Hannah, after she had weaned Samuel off of her breast, took Samuel to the house of God, the house of the prophet Eli, so he could be raised up in the ways of the Lord. The Lord called Samuel in the middle of the night and Samuel thought Eli had called him. So he went and woke up Eli and said, Eli, did you call me? And Eli said, no, no, go back to sleep. Samuel laid back down and he heard Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said to Eli, Eli, I, I thought you called me. I heard somebody call me. Eli said, that's the Lord. That's the Lord talking to you. So the next time you hear that voice, say, Lord, here am I. Do you see that Samuel had to be taught to recognize the voice of God that he wasn't sure what that was when he first heard it? That's why the Lord said, he didn't say, my lambs know my voice. He said, my sheep. In other words, you have to mature. You have to walk with the Lord a while. You have to spend time with him, and then you will get to know his voice. So a whole lot, whole lot of people ask me, but how will I know? You got to spend time with him. You got to let him talk to you. You got to get used to listening to the way he talks and the way he moves. Because generally, he's really quiet and gentle. Generally, he's really easy to miss. If you don't sit still, if you don't have your ears tuned, generally, but the Lord definitely can raise his voice and the Lord definitely can yell to let you can do all that because he's a person. I wouldn't recommend getting to the point, <laughs> that point. But anyway, anyway, the point I'm trying to make is that you got to spend time around him to get used to what he sounds like when he talks to you. And if you don't, you're never going to be able to grow up enough to recognize his voice. That's not on him. How do I know that's not on him? Because he gives you time like he gives everybody else time. If you're watching this video, if you watched me last Sunday, that means seven days have passed. That means you've got seven days just like everybody else. How much time in each one of them seven days that God just gave you did you spend with him? One more time. How much time in them seven days that God just gave you did you spend with him? How much time? See that? He gave you the same seven days that he gave everybody else. He gave you the same seven days that he gave everybody else. He gave you the same seven days he gave everybody else. How much time did you choose to spend with him? See, it's not on God, it's on you. And if you are one of the people that only talk to God once a week, you're going to have a once a week level of knowledge. You're going to have a once a week level of faith. You're going to have a once a week level of defense against the devil. And you're going to have a once a week level of anointing. That's not God. You can go to higher levels if you spend more time with him. But if you don't, that's on you. I can't stress that enough because I'm tired of hearing people whine and complain about this, about that. And I'm like, well, how much time are we spending in the word? How much time are we spending? What are we doing? Because he provided everything in the scriptures. He provides everything through our fellowship with him. But that's just it. It comes through your fellowship with him. And if you're not fellowshipping with him, then you got no right to complain that you don't got what you need. 
that you don't have what you need. I know that was bad English. You have no right to complain. Because it's not that he didn't open his hand and offer it to you. It's just that you're too busy doing other stuff and you couldn't be bothered. Okay? That's not on him. That's not on pastor, prophet, evangelist, teacher. That's not on them. That's on you. Okay? Finally, we're going to deal with the rhema word. Okay? We're going to deal with the rhema word. In Matthew 4.4 4 is where you can find the Lord, uh, that word, uh, rhema being used uh, in the scriptures. That word rhema means, let me find it, I'm trying to pull it out. That word rhema is, uh, oh, I seem to have lost that. All right, hold on, I'll pull it up. I had that tab open. I don't know what happened to it. Maybe I'll put another scripture on it. Put up right quick. Because yes, I do prepare for our come out here. <laughs> okay. Uh, Matthew four four. But Jesus answered, "It is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but by every but on every word that comes from the mouth of God." That word there, rhema. You can look it up for yourself in your Strong's Concordance. 4487. That word there is rhema. Okay? Harema. Rhema. A word by implication of matter, a thing spoken, a word or saying of any kind, as command, report, promise, a thing, matter, and business. Uh, rhema, a spoken word made by the living voice. Now, it's the fresh breathed word of God to you. A rhema word is the fresh breathed word of God to you. Let's let's listen to the definition of Bill Hammond. Bill Hammond is an apostle in the kingdom. Bill Hammond says that a rhema is an inspired word birthed within your own spirit, a whisper from the Holy Spirit like the still small voice that spoke to Elijah in the cave. It is a divinely inspired impression upon your soul, a flash of thought or a creative idea from God. It is conceived in your spirit but birthed into your natural understanding by divine illumination. A true rhema carries with it a deep inner assurance and witness of the spirit. So if you want me to simplify that, the logos word, that's the word in the Greek. The logos word, the Bible, is God talking to us. The rhema word is God talking to you. That's why you hear me say all the time, you need the prophetic in your life. The fact that God wants you to have a house is in the Bible. That's in the logos. Which house to buy is not in the Bible. 2252 Lane or 3433 Greenleaf. That's not in the Bible. The Holy Ghost has to tell you that. Which one of these houses, God, did you call me to? Which one of these houses should I make an offer on? Which one of these houses have you opened the door for me to have? That's a rhema word. The Holy Ghost got to give you a witness. That's the rhema. The Bible, the logos, is God talking to us. His commandments, his word to us. The rhema is God talking to you. A fresh breathed word of God that he will illuminate in your spirit that gives you the light, the word of wisdom, word of knowledge, direction, whatever you need. That's what a rhema word is. That's why you hear me say all the time, you need the prophetic in your life. Don't be listening to these people talking about there's no such thing as a prophetic in all that. All that is wrong because it's biblical. That's why you've made so many wrong decisions because you didn't know how to get a rhema word from the Lord. You didn't know how to, for the Lord to breathe a fresh word in your spirit through the Holy Ghost so you know what to do. That's the rhema word, okay? So we got three levels of word. We got the written word, which is the Bible. We've got the living word, which is Jesus. And we got the rhema word, which comes through the prophetic. You need all three. What I just say. <laughs> what I said was you need all three. Three. Now, that's not three words. I was just counting out the three levels of words. You mean that's actually four words. Okay, you need the written word, the Bible. You need the living word, Jesus. And you need the rhema word. You need all three. You need all three. And if you grew up with any type of religious background, you probably were around people that planted their flag in one of those. That's all about the word, the word, the word. It is about the word as a foundation. It is about the word, the written word, the Bible. But you got to know the God of the Bible. Or have, how many times have we seen people twist the scriptures and go all off the deep end? Just like the devil. <laughs> okay? 
Yes. So, or if you grew up around prophetic people, there's all, ooh, son, I see in the spirit. And ooh, I see a prosperity wave. And ooh, I see this. And ooh, I see Michael the archangel. I see his brother. And I see his nephew. And then people just getting all deep. People just getting all deep and just going off the deep end and seeing all stuff. And uh, Okay, the rainbow word will be rooted in the written word because there's no contradiction in God. The Bible does not contradict Jesus, does not contradict the contradict the prophetic. Well, you say, Prophet Taylor, if I have a relationship with Jesus, isn't that the rainbow word? Why, why can't I just stay with that? Because the Lord is not going to tell you everything in your personal, personal relationship with him. He didn't tell his friends everything when he walked with them. You need other people. You need other apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, teachers, because they have revelations of God, too, to help you to add to what God tells you, but God ain't going to, don't know one person have all the revelation. You don't even have all the revelation on your own life. <laughs> don't know one person have all the revelation. Okay? So you have your relationship with God. You have your walk with God. You know the Lord for yourself. You know what the Lord has said to you. But to add to that, to go to higher levels in the spirit, he gives other revelation experiences to other people. And then you can draw from that. That's not a substitute. substitute excuse me. That's not a substitute for your own walk with him. That's to add, edify, build up. See that? This stuff is not hard. This stuff is not hard. This stuff is not hard. Okay, so finally, last point I want to talk to you is daily practices. In other words, what am I supposed to do every day to develop this relationship? Okay, I'm going to show you exactly what to do down to small details. Don't worry. First thing in the morning when you get up, obviously when you get up in the morning, you know, go to the bathroom, throw some mouthwash in. So you're not walking around with your crusty breath, you know, wipe the crust out your eyes when you're in the bathroom. But first thing you do in the morning, you got to give God the top part of your day. You don't ever bring the Lord the leftovers of your day. You give God the top part of your day. So the first thing you do is you need to spend time with uh, all three levels of word. Time in the written word, time with the uh, preached, prophesied, spoken word, and time in prayer, time in his presence, time in the living word. So here's how you do it. The written word, you have to both study it and confess it. So when you, re when you read the scripture, you both read it and you say it, you confess it. That's how you begin to grow, by studying it and saying it. For new Christians, the place you're supposed to start is 1 John. I'm amazed at how many people that don't tell people, when I start reading the Bible, what if it's my first time reading the Bible? Where am I supposed to start with that? 1 John. That's where, towards the end of the Bible. Not the Gospel of John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, not that. That's the Gospel of John. First John is way towards <clears throat> the end of the Bible. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> it's about two or three books before you get to Revelation. <clears throat> Excuse me. My voice is getting tired. Uh, <clears throat> two or three books before you get to Revelation. <clears throat> That's where First John is. That's where you start. <clears throat> That's where you start. That's where you start, First John, if you're a new Christian, <clears throat> if you're new to the Bible. Hold on. <clears throat> I'm going to have to get some water. <laughs> Hold on one second. I'm going to see if I can pause my video. If I can't pause it, I just, Okay. Can't pause it. <clears throat> so hold on, I gotta get some water. You hear I gotta get some water. I'll be right back. Hold on. Sorry about that. I should have had my water out here. Normally I do, but anyway, I had to go get some. So where you start, if you're new to the scriptures and you're new to the kingdom, is 1 John. That's the foundational place you start when you're first studying the Bible. Okay? And then after you go through 1 John, next book you go to is Ephesians. After you go to Ephesians, the next book you go to is the Gospel of John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, that one. That's the third book you read. 
Then after you get through those three, 1 John, Ephesians, and the Gospel of John, then you move over into Romans, okay? You start with one verse a day. Don't, you know, don't start too heavy. Start with one verse a day. One verse a day. You got to start with one verse a day until you build up the habit. You'll grow, but you start with one verse a day. Just start with one verse. Next, you need to hear the spoken word, the word that's preached, taught, or prophesied to you. You ask the Holy Ghost, what do we listen to today? He will lead you. If you miss the Holy Ghost the first time, just keep asking. You've got to do it every day until you get it. You begin to develop a sensitivity to the leading of the Spirit. Because whenever you inquire of the Holy Ghost, he's going to answer you. He's going to lead you. He's going to point you to something. That's why he's here. So some of y'all may not have known that. So after you, I told you where to start in the scripture. But when you need to hear a preaching or a teaching or a prophecy, you ask the Holy Ghost at the beginning of your day, what do we listen to today? We got CDs, we got DVDs, we got MP3 downloads, and we got YouTube videos. So there's nobody that can't hear God if you want to. You have to ask the Holy Ghost, what are we listening to today? Okay? And then finally, after you spend time in the written word, after you spend time listening to uh, the word preached, taught, or prophesied to you, then you go into prayer and praise. And that's where you're spending your one-on-one -on -one time with God. So you come before God with worship. You always come before God thanking Him and praising Him. That's how you enter into His presence, into His glory. Then... You start out with the Lord's Prayer. And the Lord's Prayer is Matthew 6, 9 through 13. The reason we start out with the Lord's Prayer is because the Lord told us to pray this way. So if Jesus said, after this manner pray ye, then that's what we're supposed to do. Matthew 6, 9 through 13, King James Version. You're very familiar with it. After this manner, therefore pray ye. That's the Lord talking to his disciples. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed means reverence, respect. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts or our trespasses as we forgive our debtors or those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That's how you start out your prayer. You address God that way with the Lord's Prayer. That's how you come into his presence. Uh, after you've worshipped, after you put on some music and worship, however it is that you worship, set the atmosphere, you come into the Lord for, Lord's presence first by saying that prayer. Then you confess your individual sins, because the Lord said, forgive us our debts or our sins. That's general, but then anything that you know of, you confess before God so and ask him to apply the blood of Jesus to your spirit so he can wash you clean and to your account so those sins, sins won't be held against you. You confess your sins. And then that's confession. Then you move into supplication. Supplication is where you talk to God about your life, how you're feeling, and what you want. Everything that's going on in your life, you can talk to God about. And when I say everything, I mean everything. Literally everything. You can talk to God about your diet. You can talk to God about your exercise. You can talk to God about your weight loss. You can talk to God about your struggles. You can talk to God when you're in pain. You can talk to God uh, when you're angry. You can talk to God when you're hungry. You can talk to God when you're out of work, when you're worried, when you don't know what to do. Any situation, state, feeling, emotion, experience you're having, you lift up to God through supplication. You let the Lord, let the Lord know, this is what I'm feeling. This is what I want. This I don't understand what's going on, or I need some answers, or whatever. You just talk to, him. just take your mask off, and just talk to him. Just talk to him with no filter. Be completely honest because he knows every thought in your heart anyway. Which brings up a good question. If God already knows who we are, what we're going to say, and what we need, why do we have to pray at all? That's a good question. I like what Dr. Ivy, Ivy Hilliard said. Dr. Ivy Hilliard said, prayer does not inform God. Prayer invites God. So in other words, when we're offering up our supplications to the Lord, we're not saying those things to him because he doesn't know and because he doesn't know us and he doesn't know who we are. We say those things to him because we're inviting him into the situation because if you don't want to invite God in your life, the Lord will stay out of it. 
And because he is love, he does not force his love or his grace or anything. You have to know him. You have to get to know him to understand that. If you don't want God in this situation, if you want to pray about it, then the Lord will stay out of it. He's not going to force. He's not going to force. He's not going to force his love or his grace on anybody. God does not force. So that's the reason we pray. We don't pray to inform God. We pray to invite God. We're saying, Lord, I want you in this. Lord, this is what I'm feeling. This is what I'm going through. This is what I need. This is what I desire. This is what I'm thinking. This is what I'm afraid of. This is what I'm struggling with. I'm inviting you into it. That's why we pray not to inform him, but to invite him. Because he's a gentleman and he's not going to force. I know you've seen so many religious people in church that are just rude and nosy. <laughs> they just rude and nosy. And that's why you think God is that way. God is neither rude nor is he nosy. He already knows everything there is to know. But he's not going to get involved in your life unless you ask him in it. That's what supplication is for. So first we start out with the Lord's Prayer. Then we go into confession where you confess your individual personal sins. Then we go into supplication, where you talk to God about everything that's going on in your life. Then after supplication, you move into surrender. You say, not my will, but thine be done. So in other words, all that other stuff, all that stuff I just said to you, Lord, I'm offering it up to you on the altar, but not my will, but yours be done, because your plan is better than mine. You surrender to his lordship. When you talk to the Lord and tell him everything you're going through, you're opening your life to his love. When you turn it over to the Lord, you're opening your life to his lordship. You take the weight off of you and put it on him, and then you expect him to lead you and guide you and tell you what to do. Okay? And then finally, intercession. Intercession is where you pray for others. Your family, you should all, you, if you're married, you better be praying for your spouse every day. If you've got kids, you better be praying for them kids every day because there's a devil out there trying to destroy them. And you've got to call God's attention on your family. You've got to keep the eyes of the Lord, the ears of the Lord open, and the hand of the Lord on your family at all times. Because there's a devil out there and he's not playing games. Okay? I always told my son, I was like, if you don't know how to pray, just have kids. Kids will teach you how to pray. Okay? Because you want God to keep his eyes and his hands on your children at all times. Because you can't be with your children around the clock. Okay? But he can so you end your prayer time with God with intercession, with praying for others. So let's review. Prayer and praise, you put on some worship music and you, you set an atmosphere in your house of worship and you come into his presence with worship. You say the Lord's Prayer to start it off so we can give reverence and honor to his name as we come into his presence. So we can acknowledge we're in the presence of God Almighty. You confess your sins. You confess your individual sins and ask God to forgive you and apply the blood of Jesus to your spirit to cleanse you and to your account so those sins be not held against you. And then you move into supplication. You talk to the Lord about every detail you can think of. Then you move into surrender. Uh, supplication opens your life to his love. Surrender opens your life to his lordship. You tell him, you're the Lord. You're the Lord over my life. I'm going to do what you tell me to do about everything I just said. And then you close with intercession. You pray for others, everybody on your prayer list, as it were. Now, here's how you start. You start with 15 minutes total, five, five, and five. Five minutes reading the Bible and confessing it. Five minutes listening to a sermon or a prophecy. And five minutes in prayer. Start with five, five, five. 15 minutes total, okay? It's not going to happen all at once. You have to build the habit. I know a lot of people don't like what I just said, but... It's like weight loss. You know why people give up on their weight loss program? Because they try to lose all the weight in like a day or two. You can't. <laughs> you can't lose all the weight you're trying to lose in a day or two. Okay? It happens over time. But you cannot grow spiritually in a day or two. It's going to happen over time. So you don't start out spending four and five and six hours because you're not going to do that tomorrow. If you grow to the point where you spend hours in the Word, you grow to the point where you spend hours in the Word. What you do, I'm talking to people, I'm talking about basics where you're supposed to start. And you're supposed to start with five, five, and five, 15 minutes total. What will happen is you develop the habit. That's the point of the starting point. And then once you develop the habit, the word will start to get so good to you, you'll want to spend more time in it. Your time in prayer and praise with God will begin to get so good to you when you feel his love and you feel his glory and you feel his presence that you'll want to spend more time with him. 
And when you listen to the word of God, when you listen to the man or the woman of God, preacher, teacher, prophesy, that Holy Ghost rhema word to you personally is going to be so on point, you're going to want more. That's the thing. But do not start trying to spend those three and four and five and six hours. Like you get up at six, you got to be at work at eight. Don't be trying to spend no three and four and five because you're not going to do that seven days a week. You're not going to do that tomorrow. 15 minutes, that's where you start. Did you hear me? I said that's where you start, okay? 15 minutes, you develop the habit. Five minutes in the written word. Five minutes listening to the word. That's the rhema word. Five minutes in prayer and praise. That's time with the living word. And there you have it. Those are the basics. That's how you start. If you're a baby Christian, or if you just rededicated your life to Christ, or you've been saved a long time, but you want to, nobody ever taught you how to, how to order your day, that's how you do it. That's where you start. That's how you build your relationship with God. And I promise you, I guarantee you, as you spend time in the written word, as you spend time listening to the rainbow word, as you spend time with the living word, it's going to get so good to you, you're going to want more. You're going to want more because that's the way it is with the Lord. God is always fresh. God is always new. God doesn't have any down days. God always understands exactly where you are in your life. Uh, it's just, it's amazing. That's what I mean when I say, I can't even communicate the full experience to you. You have to experience it for yourself. But when you do, you're going to want more. So your time with him will naturally grow. But this is where you start. Did you hear me say that? I say that many times now because we're dealing with basics. 15 minutes, five minutes reading that one Bible verse and then saying it, five minutes listening to the sermon and cut it off, and then five minutes in prayer and then go on about your day. Start there. It's not going to stay there. Start there and you'll grow from there. All right? All right, that's it for today's prophetic word. This is basics part two. Just to give you a quick review. If you came in on this at any point, you got to start from the beginning. I talked about in the beginning about do you have a best friend? You know them better now than you did when you first started because that's what it's like when you have to relate when you have a relationship with a person. I said God is a person, not a set of rules. God never gave us religion. How do you develop your relationship with God? By spending time with him in the three levels of word. The written word, which is the Bible, the living word, which is Jesus and the rhema word, which is the fresh breathed word of God to you. And I gave you your daily practices, five minutes in the written word, five minutes listening to the rhema word, the preacher prophesied word, let the Holy Ghost talk to you, and then five minutes in prayer and praise. That's where you start, okay? So those are our Christian basics. And I'm glad to be able to share those with you because now you have a foundation on which to build, okay? So that's it. Uh, for this lesson, I'll be here uh, same time next week. Also, uh, No More Genius is coming up on the second Thursday of every month. I have uh, a program I do called No More Genius where I spe specifically target getting rid of the genie concept of God. That's coming up this Thursday. Thursday is the, let me see, four or five. I can just look up my calendar. I always do silly stuff like that. Thursday is the 8th. So this coming Thursday the 8th at 7 o'clock p.m., I will be here on the channel uh, doing my next No More Genies. So remember I told you in every my goal for 2021 is to increase my reach. I can't do that by myself. So in every video, I'm going to ask you to do one thing. The one thing I want you to do this week is to show up Thursday night for the No More Genies teaching. Thursday night at 7 p.m., show up and watch me live on the Facebook channel, okay? So this teaching uh, will, will be Thursday again, 7 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time, where we're getting rid of our genie concept of God. That's the one thing I want you to do this week, okay? All right, amen. God bless. Uh, leave some comments below this video if you have any more questions. And thank you so much. And uh, God bless you. I will see you next time live on July 11th at 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time next Sunday, but be here Thursday on July 8th at 7 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time. That's the one thing I want you to do for the live broadcast of the No More Genies program, okay? God bless you, and remember, it's time to get that strong 
foundation in our Christian basics.